All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, so welcome to Windows Syscalls and Shellcode Advanced Techniques for Malicious Functionality. My name is Dr. Bramwell Brizendine, and I am the founding director of the Verona Lab, which deals with vulnerability and exploitation research. I am the creator of the Shell Wasps, which is the subject of our talk. And I'm also creator of the Jop Rocket, which deals with jump point and programming, and was featured at the uh, 2021 Hack in the Box, Amsterdam. Creator of Sharem, which allows us to do shellcode analysis, including uh, Windows syscalls. Um, a system professor of computer science, and I teach primarily software exploitation, reverse engineering, malware analysis, offensive security. Basically, I teach hacking type topics. Uh, I do have a PhD in cyber operations, which is a highly technical degree. So our agenda for today, we're very much focused on Windows syscall. So firstly, we'll provide an introduction for those who may not be familiar with the topic or just need a refresher. Then we'll talk specifically about reversing syscalls in a WoW 64 Windows environment and all the modern ones. And then we'll get into Shell Wasps 2.0. Um, detailing how that works and some brand new additions that are released today. Uh, and then finally, we will get into the nitty gritty of building syscall shellcode complete with a couple demos. So that'll be really exciting. So uh, to provide a good foundation, let's talk about what is traditional Windows shellcode. So primarily, it's going to consist of techniques like walking the process environment, block the peb. And that's a very well-known technique or process. Uh, we eventually find the exports directory, and then we can go and capture the runtime address of different functions, thereby allowing us to call them at runtime. And so literally more than 10,000 Windows APIs are available <laughs> to us in this fashion. And this is the 99 0.9% of Windows shellcode that is out there. So you can see also to the right uh, in Sharem, the shellcode analysis framework, um, you can see a shellcode depicted. You see some of the peb walking up there at the top. And then below that, you can see the URL download file A is identified and it's downloading a bat file. So uh, traditional Windows shellcode for uh, exploitation, usually a little bit more simple. With malware, it could be much more advanced, more different functions being utilized. So uh, again, I said we're not going to do the traditional way. We're going to do something called Windows syscall. So just kind of a basic foundation of what those Windows syscalls all are. So um, most of our Windows APIs, at some point directly or indirectly, will call an NTDLL function. And some of those NTDLL functions will have a one-to-one -one correspondence with a Windows syscall of the same name, and others may call multiple syscalls. So the NTDLL function is going to be the last final step where we're going to go before uh, before we go from user mode to kernel mode. And as part of that, those NTDL functions are going to call Windows syscalls. And how this works is you'll have an SSN, a system service number, and that will be loaded into the EAX register. And then that sets the magic in motion. So what is the appeal to, to Windows syscalls? Why do we even care? What's so, what's so important about it? Well, with traditional Windows uh, APIs, you can invoke all kinds of malicious functionality. But if you do that, well, guess what? There's something called EDR. EDR can detect it, intercept it, it hook it. And unfortunately, it may not work out too well. But if you use Windows syscalls, then there's a really good possibility that EDR is not going to detect that. Now, there are some advanced ways where that can be feasible. But by and large, a lot of times, Windows syscalls just are not detected. So it has become extremely trendy in, in the red team community, particularly online, for Windows syscalls to, um, to be utilized. So lots of different projects and people very interested in this. So you'll hear a lot of language about Windows syscalls being undocumented. You'll have people say, well, NT-allocate virtual memory, that's an undocumented function. Well, guess what? It's actually ntl uh, allocate virtual memory is indeed documented on Microsoft's website, and there's a few dozen that are. But by and large, the vast majority 
are indeed undocumented. And so what that means is you might have to find alternative sites. There's a good one in TAPI undocumented functions. There's blog posts, forum posts. And sometimes you might get that information from having to do reverse engineering yourself. Now, if you're really, really into this, there is a good book from about 20 years ago that goes into great detail on native API, meaning NTDLL functions. And again, remember, um, a lot of these NTDLL functions have a one-to-one -one correspondence with syscalls of the same name. Name, so that's a good source to check out. Undocumented also implies that the implementation details can and do change without notice, whereas with our traditional Windows APIs, you'll have some consistency that'll be maintained. So the origins of this research, why are we even doing this in the first place? Well, I ended up getting a $300,000 NSA research grant uh, for University Lab, and it was to develop a shellcode analysis framework, Sharem. And so I wanted to emulate Windows shellcode. And I did it with the traditional Windows shell code, but then I thought, well, why don't we do that with Windows syscalls? Because I had taught students for a number of years using a special shell call called an egg hunter, which some of you may be familiar with. Egg hunter uses a syscall. So I just assumed that people are out there using uh, Windows syscalls and, and shell code, but you know what? I was wrong. It turns out that they're not. So I searched and searched uh, endlessly, and really the only instance that I could find was this 2005 Windows XP error shellcode. Uh, it used a syscall, but it had the SSN hard-coded, so it was only tied to that particular OS. And so in order to provide emulation, it needed to have actual real-world examples. And so that led to a separate project of firstly reversing them and understanding how they can work in a shellcode environment. So the focus of this research, again, is 32-bit WoW 64. And the reason for that is that is the predominant vast majority of Windows shellcode. It's 32-bit. I love 64-bit, but it's just that's just how things are. And also, if you were going to do it in a 64-bit style in terms of doing shellcode, that really doesn't need a lot of special work to do. But WoW 64, wow, that really does require a lot of special effort. So WoW 64, what that is, is we provide emulation for 32-bit applications on a 64-bit environment. So even though we're doing a 32-bit application, it's on 64-bit architecture, it gives the appearance of being 32-bit. It's actually 64-bit, and you're having constant context switching, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more in some very interesting examples. So our focus here also is, can we create shell code that is pure syscall? We want to be the 0.1%. We don't want to use Windows APIs. Can you do that? Can we advance that science? So there is a problem and a good reason why people don't use these, these Windows syscalls is what I call a problem of portability. So the SSNs are tied to a specific uh, OS build or in some cases a specific uh, service pack. So you go and put all this effort into making a shell code and it works for maybe 1507, a version of Windows 10, and then it changes and then now your shell code or your syscall doesn't work. Um, so... With Windows 10, there's more than 13 different OS builds, and so it really is important that you have to identify the OS build or the particular release so that you can use the correct SSN. Because remember, we use the SSN, we load that into EAX. If we use the wrong one, then we're actually calling a totally different syscall. So that's a syscall table from a gentleman named Giroux. Uh, it hasn't been updated for a couple of years, but it's been used uh, in a various projects uh, as a way to provide pre-computed syscall values. So you just match it up to an OS build, and then you have the SSN. And I should note also, uh, some SSNs change constantly, others periodically. Some remain the same for very long periods of time. It's really unpredictable. So let's go into a quick history of syscall usage. I talked about an egg hunter, and you can see there's a lovely egg hunter. See, she's clutching an egg, so you can imagine she's maybe, oh, an exploit developer, and she, she was limited. She couldn't use a full-size uh, shell code, so uses a, she used a teeny tiny uh, egg hunter shell code, and what that's going to do is it's going to look for the next part of the shell code, a bigger full-size shellcode somewhere in process memory. And in order to find it, she needs to use a syscall. The syscall checks to see, firstly, if the process, if the memory is valid. If it is, it can look for a specific tag like woot woot or starfall is, is another. And then if you find that, you can redirect control flow there. So the egg hunters have been around since like 
oh, I don't know, forever, 15, 20 years. And so again, I assume people were out there using uh, these types of syscalls and shellcode, but really it's limited just to special purpose egg hunters. Uh, the exception being that uh, old uh, obsolete uh, Windows XP example, um, that one actually achieves uh, equivalent um, to create process, which of course is very powerful, but it does it in an alternative way by creating registry persistence using for, uh, syscalls. It wouldn't work in today's system, although we have actually completely re re rewritten it from scratch. And so on the GitHub, you'll see there's a version that works on Windows 7, Windows 10, Windows 11. Um, so some recent history, you know, over the years, the egg hunt or the syscalls and windows have primarily been used in offensive security purposes, just as an egg hunter. From time to time, malware would use it. Uh, but in 2008, there was a report about an, a great increase on direct syscall usage and malware. Um, the author went into a great amount of detail on how these different malware samples worked. I really recommend checking it out. And that turned out to be very inspirational. So that led to the proliferation of a number of tools, starting firstly with, with Dumpert. So Dumpert came out and what that does is you match the OS build and then you use pre-computed syscall values and they do that with the RTL uh, git version function. And then later on we had the first syswhispers, uh, similar in nature, but now you're using the 64-bit PEB to identify the OS build. And these are not designed for, for shellcode. They're all completely 64-bit and it's a way to kind of extend Windows syscall usage to your traditional C, C++ applications so that they can go undetected by EDR. So a very very different, although somewhat similar, purpose to what we're doing with, with um, shellcode. Now, later on, um, Elephant Seal came along, and he came up with an extremely clever way to dynamically resolve the, the SSN. So you no longer need to use pre-computed syscall tables. You could instead dynamically resolve it, because if you... S uh, sort NT uh, functions by address, then Elephant Seal noted that they will increment by one, and so you can use this property to thereby extrapolate dynamically what something is. So uh, that turned out to be a very influential. About a month later, Sysbusverse 2 came and um, repurposed that idea, uh, a slight variation. You're doing um, functions starting with ZW instead of NT. Um, and this SysWhispers 2 has become probably the most popular um, syscall tool out there. Um, and then later on, so a number of other tools and techniques that are out there. We're not going to address everything, just going to provide kind of a starting point, really. But uh, Hell's Gate is very famous, and so we can go and extract the, the syscall value. So we'll find an NTDL function that corresponds to the syscall. We look for the move opcode, and then we can extract the corresponding syscall value. So that works well, except when it doesn't. And it doesn't when EDR comes in there and messes with and interferes with it. So if that's the case, we can turn to its twin sister. The twin sister will say, okay, this has been messed with by EDR. Let's go look at the one before or the, or the one after or the one before the, the one before. And then when we find it, we can add or subtract by the corresponding difference. So it's a, it's a refinement and uh, made by one of the, uh, the brilliant minds of uh, Sector 7, which is great for uh, malware development. So the secret behind a lot of these modern techniques is the fact that, uh, going back to Elephant Seal's idea, that these syscall values are going to be incrementing by, by one. So if you want to do it in a non-pre-computed fashion, a lot of it is going to be based on that. Okay, so let's change directions a bit, and we get into reverse engineering Windows syscalls. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive study on every aspect of WoW 64. There's talks out there that go into that level of detail and, and resources online. This is primarily the, the research that I did myself to make this work in a Windows syscall shellcode uh, environment. So Windows 7, WoW 64... Uh, what we see right here is an NTDL function for NT allocate virtual memory. You'll notice that it 
EAX, we're having hex 15 being moved there. There's some interesting stuff going on with uh, ECX being zeroed out with an XOR. We are loading ESP4, load effective address, into EDX. And then we have a little bit of stack cleanup with ESP4. And I point those out because, guess what? Those things are going to be going away later on. And most importantly here, uh, FSC0. So call D word FSC0. That's going to be our primary interface and WoW64 into invoking the syscall. So some of you may be familiar with things like the syscall instruction. An older version is in, uh, 2E and some, um, some of the newer ones, uh, also will use that internally. Um, but this with syswow, or with WoW64, sorry, we are going to be doing it with the FSC0. So let's follow that along. That will then, we dereference that, and that's going to lead us to, to a far jump. So we see a far jump there. We have the 33 selector. And what that means is we're going to transition from 32-bit to 64-bit mode. And this is something that happens naturally uh, in any 32-bit application numerous times. So FSC0 is going to be the gateway to, to, to that. So let's fast forward a bit to Windows 10, and uh, that hex 15 has changed to hex 18, so we have a different SSN. We don't have F FSC0 that's gone. Instead, we have a hard-coded offset, which, of course, can change based off of ASLR, so we can't really use that in a shellcode fashion. So at this point, things are looking kind of depressing, right? So let's continue looking on. We see, okay, there's another similar far jump, very much the same as before. And what that far jump is going to do is it's going to take us to 64-bit uh, code, um, DLL that is inserted into every process, and that helps pre prepare the transition. We're going to extend 32-bit um, registers to 64-bit. We're going to move um, some stack values to... To, to register, 64-bit registers. And so we have to save the context and then restore it and all that. And so that helps uh, prepare a lot of that. Um, but FSC0 uh, is, is a way that we can, in Windows 10, so if we look at Windows 10 at the FSC0, we can see that the same uh, address pointed to, to by that hard-coded offset is still present. So we can ignore the way that NTDLL is doing it and do the older style Windows 7 way of F FSC C0. Windows 11, some of the function names are a little bit different. We still maintain the EAX hex value uh, 18 for NT-allocate virtual memory. But largely, from our perspective, it is mostly going to be identical. And lo and behold, the FSC0 is still there, so we can probably use that for shellcode purposes, right? So let's get into the uh, aspects of shell WAFs, learning how that tool works in terms of building this and utilizing these um, Windows features. So firstly, we need to identify the OS build, and why do we need to do that? Well, because we are actually using pre-computed syscall values, and the reason for that is I want to keep the shellcode size more compact. So if we use some of these newer dynamic techniques, guess what? It's going to take up more space, more bytes. So the way that I've done this, it is actually much more compact. So... Um, you know, obviously different OS release names are going to correspond to different hex values. We get that hex value and then we, we know which one to go with. So we can achieve that through persistence. The most obvious way, and we'll have multiple ways, but the most obvious is walking the PEB. And so this one is a 32-bit PEB. It might be the first project to do the 32-bit PEB. I'm not sure. But that is just simply FS30 and then offset AC. We can capture the OS build. It's relatively simple. And, um, you know, if we're focusing on modern things, Windows 10, Windows 11, guess what? The OS builds are unique. So do we need to worry about things like the OS major version, OS minor version? Well, in that case, probably not. But in some cases, we, we do indeed need to worry about them. Uh, no worry. They're very simple to get. So similar offsets, we can dereference them. So Windows 10 and 11, they're both hex value A. For the major, there's no minor. And then Windows 7 is 6, six and 1 for the major and minor. Now, if we are mixing and matching Windows 7 and 10 and, line, and, and, 10 and 11, then in that case, we do indeed need to worry about the OS major version because the way in which we invoke the syscall is different. 
So kind of basic here, how do we turn this into shell code? So just simply the FS30, which many of you have probably seen in malware samples, or if you've done some basic um, traditional Windows shell coding, that's going to be one of the initial things you may start with. But now we just simply go to offset AC. So it doesn't take too much effort, and we see that's 4A64, which corresponds to 21H2. Now, how do we actually make the, the syscall and shellcode? Now, this is the, the old uh, original way. I have multiple new ways to, to do this, but let's talk about this first. So this is going to be a function. So we will call uh, this function. And so Windows 7, we're going to include a little bit more because it's necessary. Windows 10 is more succinct, uh, just simple two lines. But if we try to do a Windows 7 shellcode utilizing syscalls and, and do it on Windows 10 or 11, guess what? It's going to fail. It's not going to work. And vice versa. Um, and also for uh, Windows 10, uh, it's going to have kind of an implicit thing on the stack that it's expecting to be there, and we can simulate that by calling a function. So there, there are a couple of reasons why we want to call the function. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that some, some, some exploit shellcode may be more simple, may not utilize functions, but it's really not too much effort to utilize a function, and it makes our code more compact, so we do it one time instead of multiple times. Now, if we're going to do Windows 7, 10, and 11, then again, in this case, we have to identify the OS major version. We will hide that at EDI minus 4, so we can check that, and then based on the result, we can go do it the 10 way or the Windows 7 way. So either way, we are covered. So by doing this, we can have a shell code that is going to be able to work uh, across operating systems whose method of invoking the syscall on WoW64 is fundamentally incompatible. So let's get into the nitty gritty of how we set this up. So we just simply identify, capture the OS build, we're gonna create some space on the stack, and then we're gonna check and see which uh, release it is. Once we find that, we're gonna push those SSNs, the values that go into EAX, onto the stack. And then we will move that location to EDI. So EDI will be a pointer to a syscall table. So pretty relatively simple. And if we need to worry about the OS major version, no problem, we can do that. Um, so an extra line of code at the top, and then an extra line at, at the bottom, and so that will permanently be at EDI minus four. Now, we also need to maintain the integrity of EDI. So we'll do some, some uh, pushes, and we will restore it. Uh, later on to make sure it doesn't get clobbered. So let's take a look here at our syscall array pointed to by EDI so we can dereference it. So EDI, EDI plus 4, EDI plus 8, EDI plus C, and then we can easily access those SSNs. And there's another visualization. We can see the table there. Uh, we can see specifically how we are going to do that in assembly. So move EAX and then a dereference and then calling the R syscall function. So it's that simple, and it will always have the correct value as long as we're using uh, the tool properly. So speaking of which, the tool, uh, so this uh, it is a command line program, and it's really designed to automate building templates for syscall shellcode. It supports 99.9% .9 of them. I spent a few days out there searching for function prototype information. And actually, I found out uh, much later that somebody else had already done a similar thing, but that, that's okay. So um, it can build that out, and it'll give you all the function prototype information, so it'll identify the parameter names, parameter types. It'll take care of the, gritty, the gory details of setting up and managing the syscall array, restoring it, and making sure it'll work on all of the supported operating systems. So you can specify the releases that you or the uh, the syscalls that you want to do. You can enter it in the user interface. You can type it. And by the way, don't worry about capitalization. It'll auto, it'll auto correct. You can enter it in the config file. A combination of both, and you can rearrange them. So maybe you are using ten of them or ten syscalls, but maybe three of them repeat. Do we want to have? Multiple entries for the same syscall, well, no, that's a waste of bytes, a waste of space. So if you use the same one multiple times, shell wasp will know, and it will just reuse the same uh, entry. So it keeps things more sparse. 
Now, we do want to identify the releases that we are targeting, so that is very important because remember, the way that we invoke the syscall is going to differ. So you got to specify that, and if you change your mind, it's really simple to go back and, and redo it so it doesn't take too much effort, but that is an, an important step. And printing the results to screen. So there's an example. And again, like I said, this is a template. So you still need to spend the time to figure out the, the parameter values. And we'll talk extensively about that a little bit later on. But it, notice that it's identifying the parameter names, parameter types. So maybe you weren't sure which they were. Or you're not sure on the order in which they go in. Uh, you're going to see also we have a push EDI. So we keep pushing that onto the stack. And then after the, the call to the RSS call, we will restore that. So Shell Wasp will automatically calculate the number of bytes to use to restore that. Of course, you probably will be using other pushes as you build your, your shell code. So you may need to adjust that yourself. But at least it gives you a starting point. Uh, saving it to file. So if you find something you like and you want to save it to file and then start building your shell code, then it's pretty easy to export it. The config file can make our lives pretty easy, pretty simple. So if you know there's a certain type of thing you want to use consistently, go for it. And if you think about it logically, you're targeting Windows 10, you're targeting Windows 11. Do we need to target this five-year-old version of Windows 10? Who's using that? Because last time I checked, there's something called automatic Windows updates, and it's kind of hard to get out of. And if you're security-minded, why would you be using a five-year-old version of, of Windows uh, 10? As these uh, updates will occur automatically. So what I'm saying is, by and large, most people are probably going to have the two or three most recent versions of any old... OS. So we don't have to have every single version of Windows 10 or 11 in there, although we can if we want to. So in terms of invoking the syscall, now Shell Ops is going to make it as compact as possible. So if you say, I'm only going to target Windows 7, I'm going old school and targeting some place where Windows 10 doesn't exist, sure, it'll do that. And it'll ignore the uh, more modern way. And conversely, it'll do the same for Windows 10. But if you know you want it to be more universal, then it will go and consume the extra bytes by um, having the support for both. So it's all based on the input that you provide it. So that's all the old style stuff of um, Shell Wasp. But there's actually a whole bunch of new things that are released uh, today, actually. So you go to GitHub and you can see that's available today. So this first one is kind of minor, just an alternative way of getting the OS build. So there's something called user shared data, which many of you are probably familiar with. And so we can use this to get the OS build at a hard-coded offset. So 7FFE0260 will always have the OS build for Windows 10 and 11. So we don't need to do anything with the PEB. Now, if you want to do Windows 7, guess what? It's not going to work. And if you try to use this uh, for Windows 7, Shell Wasps knows better. It's not going to let you. It's going to auto automatically go to the, to the PEB way of doing it. So there's an example right there. We just switch it out. So one minor difference. Now you might say, well, I'm very elite. I automatically can recognize the user shared data by sight, and I want to try to make this more difficult to visually recognize what's going on. Could we encode that? Sure, you can do that. So you could say, oh, here's a, a couple of encoding values, one for addition, one for XOR. And so you just specify those values, and Shell Wasp will automatically use them to calculate that it's going to end up being 7FFE0260, the, the user shared data for OS build. So this next one is more interesting and perhaps less, much less familiar to, to most people. So uh, in WoW 64, if you transition to 64-bit mode, then the R12 is going to point to the 64-bit version of TEB. And actually, if you have, if you have one of uh, 32 or 64 of TEB, or 32 or 64 of PEB, you can go back and forth. So in this case, we can do essentially a double Heaven's Gate we can go from 32 to 64 bit mode and then dereference uh, TEB32 from TEB64 because at offset zero of TEB64 is TEB32, which is really convenient. And then once we capture that, we can move that into a 32 bit register and then transition back to 32 bit mode. So we're getting the PEB, but in a much less familiar way. 
So Heaven's Gate, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, but for those who may not, I'll give a quick review. So Heaven's Gate is where we can transition from 32 to 64-bit mode. The Windows OS does it naturally many times, just like that long jump we talked about earlier. But in terms of shellcode type things or malware type things, you'll typically see it done in a different fashion. You'll see a push 33 or a push 23. So we're pushing the selector. And then next we want to push the destination. The destination can be anything. So literally anywhere in memory. But when we go to that destination, then it's going to switch to 64-bit mode. So conveniently, a lot of people will just simply go to the offset that follows the red F. So we do a, a get PC gadget there with the call next F, and then we're going to modify that. We're going to add to it. So the destination is then immediately after the red F. Again, lots of flexibility there. We don't need anything fancy, though, so we'll just do it the traditional way. So here's an AI-enhanced image of what Shell Wasp will create for us. So we have the initial Heaven's Gate. And then we have 64-bit code. Now, when we're doing things in 32-bit, we have to do 64-bit in a special way. So if you're doing like inline assembly, then you'll want to do emit. So this is a Visual Studio style. And then there's a kind of a DB, initialized data st style. Don't worry, Shell Wasp will do both for you. You can select that in the menu system. And then going back to, to, 60, to x86 is pretty simple. And by doing this, we can now get the, the PEB from EBX plus 30. Of course, we could use any other 32-bit register. But this has a benefit of stealth because not everybody maybe recognizes Heaven's Gate. They may have heard of it. Uh, if you're following it in a debugger, then it's going to be confusing. The debugger is going to skip over 64-bit code. Uh, most debuggers are not able to, to handle or support this. Only the 64-bit version of WinDebug will. And if, why would you be looking at a 32-bit application in a uh, 64-bit version of WinDebug? You wouldn't, unless you had a reason to suspect it was doing that. Same thing with debuggers. You're going to pick uh, an architecture, typically. So uh, the new version provides multiple different ways of capturing the OS build. So it's a little bit of a way to add a little bit of stealth um, if you want to. But really, it's kind of a minor thing, in my opinion. We get the OS build. That's cool. That's interesting. How do we invoke the syscall? So again, as a, as, as a review, the 64-bit way, we do a syscall. Uh, we could, in some cases, do a sysenter or an int 2e, but pre predominantly syscall. And that's a 64-bit instruction, so we can't just say, okay, I want to do a syscall in the x86 while 64. It doesn't work that way, because it's a 64-bit instruction. So um, indirectly, you, you can do that if you prepare the context. Uh, you can save the x86, everything there, and then you go and um, transition. You expand registers. You move certain uh, parameter values to corresponding x64 uh, registers. You do a lot of elaborate setup. Then in that case, you, you can do that. Sure, no problem. So I guess you could say that the traditional way and, and WoW 64 of invoking that has been the FSC0. Now, if you go back even further, I believe um, Windows XP, the 64-bit version, um, I think it had a, a similar thing to the FSC0 and the user shared data, but that's so old and obsolete that you know we really don't care. It's outside the scope. We're talking about modern techniques. So I had... Um, Recently, about in December, I was just trying to dig a little bit deeper. I'd been using the FSC0, and I'd read different papers and resources. So I'd come over some of this other stuff before, but it never really uh, clicked with me until I was looking at it in the debugger. And I noticed following it, so I followed it. Instead of 32-bit debugger, I followed it in a 64-bit debugger. And then I saw immediately uh, after that far jump, jump keyword pointer R15 F8. And so I thought, okay, that's that's cool. It's a constant. That R15 and, and this particular offset is always going to help facilitate the next part of the transition. Can I take this and weaponize that the same way we do FSC0? People may recognize FSC0. Maybe they don't recognize this jump keyword pointer R15 F8. So I wasn't sure about that, but it didn't take too much effort to, to figure out that it, this actually does work. Now, of course, 
Implicit in this working is you also have to do a transition to 64-bit mode. So yeah, you got to do a heaven's gate. But if you do that heaven's gate, then you can ignore the FSC zero and you can do the jump keyword pointer R15 F8. And beyond that, it's going to be additional Windows internals. We're going to do WoW 64 uh, transition layer kind of stuff I've alluded to before. So let's see the the the, the shell code produced by shell wops. And notice here we do, we have uh, the DB style that you might see like NASM instead of the the emits. Again, it produces both. But we do a couple things here. So we have a Heaven's Gate that. Uh, let's see if I can get this pointer working. Huh. I'm just not. <laughs> I'll use my mouse. There we go. Super elite. So we have some uh, Heaven's Gate going on right there. We've got the 33 selector to transition. But then over here, we're doing a Git PC, and notice I'm adding 17 to ESP, and that's going to take us to this ret down here. And the reason why is I want that to be consistent with the different ways in which we can invoke the syscall. So... Uh, and also from, I also mean from that perspective, the stack cleanup needs to be identical. So remember, we need to constantly restore the EDI register. So by doing this, it's, I'm just going to return here. This red is going to go and consume something off of the stack. And we can maintain consistent, um, maintain consistency. So benefits of this new approach, we can see x86. Uh, that's what it looks like. If you're following it in debugger, you're going to see this. It's a jump D word EDI. F8. Gee, I wonder what that is. But if it's X64, we can see what it really is. Again, a lot of people may not be seeing this. If you're doing it in X64, it's just going to skip over that. So then I thought, okay, this is interesting, but could we push it a little bit further? Could we instead um, maybe not do the R15 F8 and instead do more of what's going on. So what happens next is the WoW 64 context is then starting to be prepared. That's what, what's being done. Um, so could we do some of that ourselves? We can to a point. Uh, and I took it as far, as far as I could. Uh, after that, then um, I couldn't really take it any further because then the, some of the offsets could change based on ASL, ASLR, and so it wouldn't be consistent from one particular version to another. But we could take it to the jump keyword pointer R15 R, RCX uh, times 8, which is a turbo thunk dispatch. And so this is the, the shell code, the, the result. So this is another alternative way of invoking the syscall. So a little bit more code. Uh, again, we're doing Heaven's Gate. We don't have that um, messy stuff with um, getting the um, Git PC at the, at the, the top. Uh, in this case, there is no red at the bottom. It's just going to return to the, the next instruction uh, after the calling the rsyscall function. So this is actually similar to what the Windows OS does, but I have had to modify it uh, in small, subtle ways so that it behaves in a way that works well for, for shell offs. It's going to return to the correct location that I want it to. The stack cleanup is going to be identical to um, the other ways of doing that. And I wanted to keep it as sparse as I could, so I didn't want to have a, a ret there at the bottom. Uh, the last thing would be the jump keyword pointer R15 RC8. And then from there, it'll go into more Windows internals and then eventually go into kernel mode. And then it'll return, and then the Windows OS will help facilitate tr transition back to 32-bit mode. So we are not doing that. The Windows OS is doing that for us. So I thought, okay, that's the modern way of doing, what, doing it. What about Windows 7? Can we do the same thing with the R15 F8, just a single line of code? Actually, we can't. That's, that's sad. But the good news is we can do a similar thing with extended x64 code, similar to Similarly, we're preparing the WoW 64 context. So we do a, a Heaven's Gate, a little bit more code. So this is not code that, this is, these are comments, by the way, if you're not aware. And then these are the actual bytes that, um, now when we see this in a debugger, it's going to look like this. So we have a lot of increments and decrements. We have ESPs and EBPs, but that's not actually what's happening. What's happening is we have R13, R12, R15. So that could be much more confusing to somebody if they're not really in on what's going on and they're trying to understand it. 
Now, of course, if you're an elite professional malware analyst, um, you may have more knowledge. You can probably figure that out. But that's, you know, the, the, the goal here is to provide multiple ways to invoke the syscall, to add a little bit more stealth to, to the proceedings, and to make it a little bit more complex. So it's really up to you in terms of how you want to invoke the, the shell code. And again, I've designed it so you can mix and match. So if you prepare it in one way, perhaps doing the FSC0, and then you decide, I want to try it the other way, then you can just simply change the inside of the RSS call function. You don't have to mess with anything else. So that was one of the goals here. So... Those are the promised new ways of uh, invoking the syscall um, indirectly in, in the WAF64 environment. So three of them um, for Windows 7 and 10 and 11, and then the previously existing FSC0. Um, so with, you can also decide, okay, I want to do NASM style or inline assembly. It's pretty simple. It's a little switch you want to do. And this is just for the 64-bit one. So however you're generating your shell code, it just makes your life a little bit easier so you don't have to convert it. There's an example of the inline assembly for Visual Studio. It looks kind of gross. you got all these e different emits there, but that's how it works. There are other different ways of, of doing this where you use e emits for other uh, ways of compiling. Uh, those are not supported right now. Okay, so let's switch gears now. We've talked about the tool. How do we actually build a syscall shellcode? Let's see if we can figure that out. So the goal here, create a shellcode that is all Windows syscalls. We're not going to use Windows APIs. Maybe we can evade EDR. That'd be cool. One problem is when you are doing stuff with syscalls, there's just a lot fewer of them available, meaning a lot less functionality. Now, in some cases, Windows uh, NTDL functions may utilize multiple uh, syscalls, so you possibly could get more, more functionality out of that, multiple uh, syscalls chained together, um, take a little bit more effort. Uh, so the, the task here, specifically what we're doing, is going to be process injection, and we're going to have a second stage uh, shellcode that will execute. The second stage shellcode is traditional, Windows API, but the other one is not. So the requirements here is going to be portable against multiple OS builds, multiple operating systems. We don't want to be using hard-coded uh, syscall values. That's 2005 style. We're 2023, right? So the exact steps that we want to use, uh, first we want to create a region of memory for our system process information, and that's going to have exhaustive information on all of the different processes, including their PIDs. And then we want to identify Discord, because guess what? We are attacking Discord. And then we are going to uh, utilize URL mon. We're going to create a file to that, and then we'll create a handle to it, and then we will map it out into Discord. Uh, we will then, then change the memory permissions to RWX, and then we will hide the stage two shellcode in there by using by writing it into it. And then we will cause a thread and cause it to be executed, and then from there the magic begins. So this one uses ten different syscalls, and my goal here is to show you you can do something that has lots of syscalls somewhat advanced functionality. This particular type of process injection, I don't know if it's been done before. Uh, there are a lot of people that specialize in process injection, so it may be new, it may not be. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, certainly, I don't think that um, syscalls are used in this fashion, uh, at least not in shellcode, uh, outside of that in your um, uh, C++ or C application, sure. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So firstly, we want to create a region of memory, and we can do that with uh, NT allocate uh, virtual memory. That can do that for us. And it's going to take up a lot of space. So we're going to give it a lot of space because maybe we have hundreds of different processes. If you want to be more elite, you can check and see if it, if it, if it fails because the syscall will tell you that, and you could increase the amount. Uh, this shellcode doesn't do that, but you could do that if you wanted. So the specific shellcode for the, responsible for that, you can see that right there. Uh, how we are doing that with uh, the syscall there is we have the, the shell wafts way with EDI plus 24. We don't have to worry about that or keep track of that. Shell wafts does that for us, so we just borrow it. We're calling the rsyscall function. 
and then we are restoring the pointer to EDI and then pushing it on the stack. That way it just doesn't get lost or less likely to, to do so. Now you could move that to a hard, to a different offset. It doesn't have to be EDI. Again, this is just an automated way to do that. Somehow you need to preserve the, the, the pointer to the syscall array. And then from there you can focus on doing the actual meat of the shellcode, which is preparing the parameters. So uh, creating the system information or system process information structure. So actually, I believe a few years ago, I had heard that um, there was a, an uptick in malware authors utilizing system information classes of the different types. You can get a lot of information. And the one that we are doing, system process information, is just one type. So Microsoft released a lot of information on that. They're kind of forced to. Um, but our goal here is we just want to go in there, get the PID for Discord, and then we will need that PID for stuff going on later. So NT query system information is going to be responsible for that. We have the function prototype here. We have a parameter. Some are going to be inputs, and then some will be output. So Discord goes bye-bye. So here's the system process information structure. It's pretty simple, more or less. So you click here, next entry, offset. That can advance you to the next um, entry in there. But we could check the name, so we're maybe checking for Discord. And if we find it, we can then capture the PID. So uh, how we can call that in terms of the shell code. So there's the chunk of code that does that. And we have EDI plus 20. And then the result will be given to us. And now we need to parse the results. So we want to put Discord on the stack. And there are multiple ways you can do that. This is just one way to do that. We need an object attribute structure. So let's go ahead and make that. A lot of these are going to be null bytes with that EDX there. Um, so a lot of syscalls will involve lots of structures. But a lot of them end up being null bytes. So identifying the target process. Now, I did a previous uh, talk, and uh, we did a variation, a much simpler variation. So this part of the code comes from uh, one of my students, uh, Tarek. And it's just going through and iterating through the different entries so that we can identify the, the PID by capturing Discord. And we'll see an example of that in the demo. So once we get the PID, then we can go and save that, put that in, a, in the um, client ID structure, uh, so there's a PID right there. And then now we need to convert that PID to a handle, a handle to the process. Because remember, situation is we've maybe done some exploitation, and we've caused it to want to run in one process, but we won't want to target Discord, which is a different external process. So we need that process handle, not the PID. So this will allow us to convert it, and then we'll get that in the output parameter right there, the P handle. So our next step is preparing URL mon. We're going to put that the, the word URL mon on the stack. And then we're going to put that instead of a Unicode string structure. I know it seems redundant, right? But that's just how Windows works. And then we put this inside an object attribute uh, structure. And that's just one parameter for the many parameters for NT create file. So now we're creating a file for URL mon. At this point, it's not physically or semi-physically anywhere. It's just kind of pre-existing. So we need to, oh, and there's the shell code that, that, that does that. We have EDI plus uh, 18. And we have our parameters that are identified for us. A lot of these are null bytes. How do you know which ones they are? Well, that's part of the process. you got to go in there and investigate and see what's required. It can require a lot of trial and error. So experimenting in a debugger will work well. So we're going to uh, do NT create section, and we're going to create a section for URL mon. And so this section will be existing in, in nowhere land. We need to then go and map it out. And we will get a handle to the section right here uh, at a pointer location that we provide. So we can just check that location, and we have the handle. And then now we want to map it. So a lot of you are probably familiar with process hollowing where we unmap something. This is kind of the opposite. We're actually mapping it. We're mapping URL mon into to Discord. So it'll exist in Discord. And um, our next step then is we need to do NT protect virtual memory. So you, many of you are probably familiar with, with uh, virtual protect. This is similar to that, uh, or the lower level version. Uh, so we can do that, get our RWX permissions, and then NT write virtual memory can allow us to go in there and then write uh, at that location. And we're going to do offset 3000 into it. 
And then once we're done, it'll be at that specific location. We have that exact location. And then we can do NT create thread. So with NT create thread in Discord, at this point, it'll immediately begin executing. Uh, in some cases, you'll need some additional steps and NT wait for single object is one that will, in some cases, other different pro processes will, will be required. So at this point, let's see an actual demo. How exciting. So pre-recorded demo. We're inside a WinDebug. And we're checking the OS build. It's Windows 7. Oh, how old. Uh, what are we doing next here? So we are creating the syscall array. We've got the syscall numbers on the stack now. And we're going to do nt-allocate virtual memory. And check our, uh, the pointer to the allocation. Let's go check it. Okay, there is the address. Let's do a vproc on it, see if it's RWX. Did it succeed in its goal? Yes, it did. We have RWX. So next, we are going to do NT query system information. This is a little bit complicated, so we're going to go and get that. And then once we do that, we need to get Discord on the stack. And then we need to start parsing it. And we're going to do that with string comparison there. Rep, rep comp uh, will do that for us. And so we have Discord, and we can, we're just checking. You can check hundreds of different ones. And eventually, if Discord is active, you'll find Discord. And then we can capture the PID. So we skipped over capturing it, but we got, we got the PID. So now we're doing the, getting the process handle to that. And now we're going to do NT create file. We're going to do that on URL non, as we described uh, previously. And let's go and check the actual application, see if those handles are existing. So we have a handle to Discord. We have a handle to URL mon. Good, good. So let's continue on. NT create section. We've got to get a section for URL mon. And then now we need to, well, let's go and check that section. And there's the, the pointer to the section, hex 50. Can we find uh, hex 50 over in the application? Yep, there it is. So you're doing well so far. So let's map that out. We're going to map it into to Discord. And so let's go and check the pointer to URL mon. We have the offset. So let's open up Discord. We can open up Discord and check at that exact location and see if we succeeded. Okay, 4D5A, MZ. We have the DLL inserted, so that is URL mon. Cool. Let's do NT protect virtual memory. We can change this to RWX. So let's go ahead and do that. And uh, go back to the same location, do a vproc. So it's a different type of RWX. It's still writable for us and executable. Um, Continue on. And checking it, that offset 3000, and that is our actual shell code. And so right there at the bottom, that's a stage two shell code, which is just a simple message box, but it could be anything. So let's continue on, NT create thread. So this should cause it to start executing. So we get a pointer to the thread. Thread is zero, so we haven't done it yet. But let's go ahead and do it. And there we go. We got the message box. So we succeeded. Uh, we did that. Now, you notice that was Windows 7. So what happens if you go to Windows 10? Well, CFG comes into play. CFG, you get an int 29, uh, which is a special, very, very special fast fail. So immediately terminates it. So is it the end of the world? Well, it could be, but... Maybe it's not. So how do we check if it has CFG? We could use Process Hacker. So uh, we can see there, Control Flow Guard, Windows 7, CFG doesn't exist. Obviously, 10 and 11, it does. But we actually can defeat CFG with syscalls. So NT set information virtual memory. We can go and create an exception for that so we can not have to worry about that. Now, this is one that is a little bit more complicated. It's a much more advanced one, and it's not as well documented. So a couple of blog posts out there, some conflicting information. So some questions that would need to be resolved. Uh, it would probably involve some reverse engineering to, to resolve that. And as part of the process of doing that, how would you even do that? And so I'm trying to demonstrate kind of the, the technique or the mindset for people here. So uh, you could look at the corresponding kernel base function, which is set process valid call targets. Now, this one is very simple, easy to use, direct values, no pointers. You can do this, and it works pretty easily. You create the CFG exception. 
So what you could do is you could set, oh, I don't know, like a breakpoint at uh, the kernel base function, and then look at the parameters, see what those specific values are, and then we could set a breakpoint at the corresponding ntdl function that corresponds to the syscall. So there we go. And then let's look at the, the corresponding uh, parameters. What is similar? What is different? And we can investigate further. Maybe we use a disassembler. So in some cases with these syscalls, again, they're not well documented. You may need to do some reverse engineering to, to make it work. So let's do another variation. I actually spent a couple months where I just did all kinds of really random uh, different syscalls. Uh, most of your syscalls will be chains, multiple things, not just going to be a single one. Uh, this is another short one we have time for. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. So this one is kind of annoying, similar thing. We're going to look for a process. Let's do notepad, and then we're going to immediately cause it to terminate. So that's kind of relatively simple. But what if you want to go push it a little bit further and make it more uh, sophisticated? Maybe you're looking for antivirus. It'll cause antivirus to terminate. And maybe you put it in a loop and so it's going to continuously make everything terminate. And maybe you're looking at multiple antivirus things. So that could potentially be very powerful. But in this instance, it's more simple. So we have four different syscalls. Uh, and let's go do check that out. We have a very brief uh, demo on that. So there's our notepad. And it's going to be our target. And we're going to, do, we're going to building the syscall array. Um, much like before, checking our syscall array. So right there, we can see our SSNs uh, doing NT allocate virtual memory. We get a pointer to the allocation. So let's check that out. There we go. Let's do a vproct on that. Do we get RWX? Yes, of course. We have our RWX. So we can then go and build all of our process information there, utilizing NT query system information. So we're going to skip over the gory details. We've, we've already seen it. Right now we're inside the RSS call function. We can just see how that works. It's going the Windows 7 style, but it supports both. So it's uh, kind of universal. There's the far jump. And this is an X64, so we, we didn't go into 64-bit mode. Or I'm sorry, this is x86. So we skipped over the x64 stuff like a normal person would. So eventually we got the PID. We didn't then do the NT open process, uh, converting the PID to a handle to the process. Oh, it's paused. <laughs> so there we go. We have the, the hex 48. And we could open the application, notepad. There we go. We have pointed to notepad. And now let's do an NT terminate. And there's our notepad. So look right there at notepad. So it should disappear. You know, I'm being so obvious. And uh, it's gone. It disappeared. So we have a few slides of closing remarks here. So this is something that can come into play when you are doing very long shell codes. So at some point, ESP and EBP can start colliding. So maybe you prepared some stack parameter value that you're using much earlier on, and the normal control flow operations occur, and it causes it to subtly be overwritten. And maybe you don't notice it, and it can be harder to, to, to trace. Uh, so that can happen. You could say it's just uh, irresponsible coding. you got to be more responsible. Sure, that's true. So just being careful could be one way to, to address that. You also could do something like NT allocate virtual memory. Maybe you relocate uh, EBP there, or maybe you just go and build your parameters at that location. You can avoid that, that potential issue coming into play. So some, some practical information, assuming you're going to go out there, you're going to start building a Windows uh, syscall, some things, tips to help you. So it's going to use a lot more pointers. Uh, a lot of our traditional Windows APIs will be non-pointers, not all of them. But by and large, a huge number of pointers, and you'll have many different structures in nested structures. So we have a stack value here to a structure, a P object to attribute structure. One member is a Unicode string, and then therein is a pointer to a Unicode string. So just get used to a lot of those nested things if you're doing Windows syscalls. And when you're doing it in shellcode, you have to prepare that yourself. You're doing pushes. You're building it on the stack. When you're doing it in higher-level programs, it's very easy to automatically do these things and not have to give it much thought. But it can be much more tedious doing it in, in shellcode. We also have to worry about constants. So there'll be lots of constants that are required. It's easy to use a string constant, but in shellcode, we don't have that benefit. We'll do the hex value. So where do we find them? Well, we could Google the corresponding string name for the, the constant 
for a parameter. We could look at the Microsoft documentation. We could look at the SDK header files. We could also just click compile it and then reverse it, use the string constant, and we could then thereby see what the, the, the compiler generates for us. But one way or another, we need to find the hex value. And how do you find the right hex value that's actually going to work? Well, that might involve some experimentation, some trial and error. If you have the benefit of consulting resources online, blog posts, forum posts, sure, you can do that. You could also see what the Windows system natively does. That could be one way. NT status codes are your friend. They're extremely beneficial. So unlike Windows APIs, we're not going to have our return value in EAX. We will have the NT status code in EAX. So the zero, zero means success. You're doing a good job. A lot of other things are error messages. Maybe it didn't work right, but they're very helpful. So it tells you what's wrong. So you can go research it and figure out how to correct that. So I use that quite a bit to help figure out how to get things to work correctly. Now, not all of them are bad. Some of them, some of them are just simply informational. Status image not at base. Okay, it still worked. It's just at a different image base. Now, in terms of developing syscall shellcode, my personal recommendation is maybe do start using it in inline assembly. That way you can do an N3. You can do it in your wind debug very easily. But at some point, you probably want to move on to traditional shellcode because there can be some subtle differences. Um, but for beginners, doing it in inline assembly in, in Visual Studio probably would work well. And of course, use, use shell WAFs. You can save you a lot of the effort in terms of dealing with the SSN. Now, if you wanted to go and use it, uh, one of the other existing dynamic techniques, sure, you could do that if you wanted. Uh, how we identify and get the, the SSN, there are multiple ways in which we could do that. So the final thoughts, creating syscall shellcode is going to take a lot more effort than um, with Windows APIs. And I say that from the perspective of having taught uh, quite a number of students in different graduate courses how to create complex Windows API shellcode that can take them a lot of effort. This is an order of magnitude higher. But then again, ease, difficulty, it's all relative. If you know how to do it, then it's easy. So uh, everything eventually becomes easier in, in cyber, right? So um, you also need to be aware that not all functionality may be easily accessible via syscall. So if you start wanting to do very advanced functionality, then you may need to go and use a lot more syscalls than you would use normally if you're doing Windows APIs. You'll need to use lots of pointers, lots of structures. But if you are successful, then potentially you can maybe evade EDR and you're doing something that not, not a lot of people have done. Now I've talked to some people, I actually released an earlier version of this at the, uh, the last DEF CON. Um, some people have started to, to do this, but I don't think a lot have. Um, so I think probably the holy grail would be to maybe do something like kind of like a, a pure syscall style interpreter or, or comparable functionality. So maybe one of you will do that. Uh, in the meantime, I encourage you to go and download uh, shell WAFs. You can star it if you like it. Check out the Sherm shellcode analysis framework. Uh, their slides should be available uh, through Hack in the Box. Um, Looks like we're out of time, so if you have questions, you can just catch me afterwards, and I'll be glad to entertain any questions there. Thank you.